Don't believe the hype machine. We provide survival news for folks. Don't believe the hype machine. Death of the journalist. To help you overcome any fear of the future. Don't believe the. Don't believe the. Don't believe the. Don't believe the. Friday, April 18th, 1930. Hey everyone, welcome to Barn Cat Media. This is a show where I talk about books, films, and events of the past and present through the lens of cultural and media theory. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking about Lawrence Lessig's book, Free Culture, and some of his ideas and research on intellectual property law in the digital age. I'm also going to be talking about H.R. 3261, the Stop Online Piracy Act, or SOPA, and I'm going to be couching this piece of legislation in the argument that Lessig makes about uh, the internet and uh, culture. So some of the major backers of SOPA are the culture industry, by which I mean the film distributors, the uh, music industry, and the publishing industry. And uh, these companies also own a lot of the major news outlets, which is why there's been a bit of a media blackout on the issue, um, at least for a while. Now if you read the bill, it's got some pretty ominous implications for freedom of speech. Uh, however, for the purpose of this discussion, I'm only going to focus on the provisions concerning so-called copyright infringement and the ramifications these would have on the way we interact with our culture on the internet. So in the summary of the bill, uh, among other things, it says that it would require online service providers, internet search engines, payment network providers, and internet advertising companies upon receiving a copy of the court order relating to an attorney general action to carry out certain preventative measures including withholding services from an infringing site or preventing users located within the U.S. from accessing the infringing site, expands the offense of criminal copyright infringement to include public performances of copyrighted work by digital transmissions and work intended for commercial dissemination by making it available on a computer network. So in short, what SOPA would do is it would expand the scope of copyright infringement uh, into the internet uh, by punishing or disabling any website that hosts copyright infringement, while also uh, defining copyright infringement to include a lot of the user-generated content that we see on sites like Facebook and YouTube. So on the surface, these provisions seem reasonable enough. I mean, if you're the copyright holder to a song or a movie, why shouldn't you have a right to control how your content is used and accessed on the internet? Well, to better understand that question, we need to take a step back, as Lawrence Lessig does in his book, and re-examine how the issue is being framed. And it's being framed as property versus piracy. So on one end, you have the copyright holder who is trying to protect their right to control how their content is used. Well, on the other side, you have the pirates, people who are trying to get access to that content without any regard for the law or compensation to the copyright holder. Uh, Lawrence Lessig rejects this um, understanding of the issue by saying that while some copyright protection is important for providing incentive to creators, um, what we're seeing, uh, what we've been seeing throughout history and uh, most recently with SOPA is not so much a protectionism of artists, but rather a protectionism of the business status quo. Never before has so much of our culture been controlled by so few companies with such enormous power. And the internet is a threat to that status quo because it makes possible radically new ways in how our culture can be created and interacted with. While the debate concerning copyright law on the internet is obviously new in many regards, um, this resistance from the culture industry to emerging technologies is something that we've been seeing for centuries now. And to illustrate this point, um, you could begin in 17th century England with the Conger, and this was a, a powerful publishing syndicate comprised of a, a small group of the most powerful publishers at the time. And they exercised a monopoly over the industry by taking advantage of the uh, copyright law that existed at the time, which was the Licensing Act of 1695. And this granted a perpetual copyright protection to the holder. Um, and so um, by taking advantage of this, the uh, Conger were able to prevent the passage of works into the public domain. And by doing that, it was very difficult for a startup company to um, emerge and challenge the Conger's dominance in the industry. Um, and this is all despite the printing press's ability to make publications more widely available. So with radio, we can jump to 1933, where um, Edward Armstrong invents frequency-modulated uh, radio. Um, this is a, a far superior uh, method of transmission than AM radio that was being used at the time. 
Um, so uh, the Radio Corp Corporation of America, RCA, um, they recognized the threat of FM to their dominance in the industry, and so they successfully lobby the FCC to uh, prevent any all allocation of the airwaves to FM radio. So they're able to uh, maintain their uh, dominance in the industry despite um, this new technology of FM radio that would uh, be able to transmit signals to people in remote locations that weren't getting access to radio at the time. So with video, we can jump to 1984 uh, in a case in which Disney and Universal sue Sony for its invention of uh, video recording devices. Disney and Universal make the argument that Sony had created a device that enables copyright infringement as people are now able to uh, make recordings of TV shows to watch at a later time. With the internet, we can begin in 1998 with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This makes it illegal to hack or circumvent copyright protections. So it is now uh, software code as well as physical devices that the culture industry is attempting to regulate so as to prevent um, content from being more easily accessed. And there's a ton of examples in between the ones I just gave. I just wanted to sketch a historical outline of how copyright law has been invoked um, as a way of uh, protecting the status quo of, of how uh, culture is produced and disseminated. So now that we have a historical context um, to situate peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and other digital capabilities in, um, we still haven't addressed why the culture industry's position on copyright and why the provisions in SOPA should be rejected. Uh, and Lessig, in his book Free Culture, lays out a lot of arguments, including a cost-benefit analysis of why why peer-to-peer -peer file sharing makes economic sense. Um, I'm only going to focus on two arguments, um, the first one being the most compelling in my opinion because it invokes the U.S. Constitution. So in Article 1, Section 8, which is also known as the Progress Clause, it says that Congress has the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries. Now the language here is really important, as Lessig and others have pointed out, because this is the only uh, constitutional provision in which the framers voiced their intent for the provision. So with all the other provisions in the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights, they never tell us why we have those rights. They just tell us that we have those rights. But with the Progress Clause, uh, the framers were very careful in telling us the intent of the clause. And the intent of this power is to promote progress. It is not to enrich the copyright holder by ensuring a perpetual protection of their content. So by specifying that copyright terms be limited, the framers foresaw the importance of a public domain in a free and open society. By 1790, they interpreted limited times to mean uh, an, an initial term of 14 years after which, if the author was still alive, they had the option to renew for a second term of 14 years, so uh, providing a grand total of 28 years of copyright protection for the artist or creator to enjoy whatever economic benefits may have come from their creation. It's also important to note that uh, the original uh, interpretation of copyright did not include any derivative works, just the original. Lessa goes on to provide uh, a history of copyright legislation, uh, saying that in its first 100 years, the term was extended only once, in 1831, as the initial term was increased from 14 to 28, making a grand total of 42 years of copyright protection. Over the next 50 years, it was increased only once, in 1909, as the renewal term was also extended from 14 to 28 years, making a total of 56 years. Then beginning in 1962, Congress extended the terms of copyright 11 times in 40 years, most significantly with the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998, which extended the term by 20 years, making a total of 95 years for works created before 1973. So during this 40-year period, in addition to expanding the scope and terms of copyright uh, quite dramatically, Congress also abandoned the framer's renewal requirement, which was intended to ensure that work that was ready to pass into the public domain could do so more quickly. So now, all copyrighted work is given one term, which is the maximum term. So hopefully that history illustrates uh, just how far we've come from what the framers intended. And you might argue that because the framers were vague when they said limited times, then to uh, 
constantly uh, expand the scope in terms of copyright, just as SOPA would do, uh, doesn't really constitute a breach of the Constitution. However, if we allow the scope of copyright to be perpetually expanded, uh, what it will do is it will effectively render the Progress Clause useless by um, preventing the passage of works into, pu into the public domain and really curtailing our ability to access, without legal repercussions, uh, much of the content that makes up our culture. So that's a constitutional argument as to why the culture industry's position on copyright and the provisions in SOPA should be rejected. A second argument has to do with the unique architecture of the internet and the implications this has on what it means to make a copy of something. Now compare the internet to real space, um, say for example a bookstore. Now after I've bought a book from a Barnes and Nobles, I am free to buy and sell that book at a used bookstore or a garage sale or whatever, and that's because uh, copyright says that after I've paid that original price, I've compensated the copyright holder, and from that point on, that book is no longer subject to the regulation of the copyright holder. And this is because no, no matter how many times this book is bought and sold, it is still the original copy. I am not duplicating this book in order to make another transaction. Now in the case of the internet, all of this changes. Say I've purchased a song on iTunes or I've downloaded a, downloaded a book for my e-reader. Now because of the very architecture of the internet, every time you download something, you've made a copy of it and it is therefore subject to copyright regulation. So anybody who has ever tried to transfer songs from one iTunes library to another may have received this message. So in this example, iTunes is regulating what we're able to do with this copy of a song, despite the fact that we've purchased this copy, presumably. Now in the case of derivative uses, uh, copyright regulation becomes especially constraining to creative expression on the internet. Um, so for example, if I wanted to use a copyrighted song in a video that I've made in order to uh, either make a joke or say something other than what the original artist intended. Hey, I got the new dance for y'all called a soldier boy. You just gotta punch then crank back three times from left to right. Uh, Under uh, bills like SOPA, the web, not only could I be punished, but the website hosting my video, like YouTube or Facebook, can be blocked or disabled. And so the problems with things like SOPA become a cultural one, because the internet, just like its technological predecessors, not only enable freer access to information, but they radically change the way we interact with culture. And in today's capture and retrieve digital culture, um, many of the forms of creative expression involve borrowing from and expounding upon existing works. And so the question becomes not property versus piracy, but should we allow today's growing generation of internet users to be criminalized for the way they have learned to interact with culture, or should we instead strive to strike a balance between maintaining incentive for creation through copyright protection while also promoting progress of the useful arts and sciences by embracing new technological capabilities? And how that balance is to be achieved is not by using the law to cripple the revolutionary qualities of the internet, such as uh, SOPA would do. Instead, as Lessig says, we need to interpret intellectual property law as intended by the framers in which the promotion of progress and not the empowerment of the rights holder is the driving force behind intellectual property rights. And we need to maximize the benefits of file sharing while minimizing its harms. And there's been uh, some steps towards this direction with the copyright alternative Creative Commons license, which gives both creators and recreators more liberties on how content is to be used. So in conclusion, SOPA is not about stopping piracy. It's about uh, ensuring that the culture industry maintains its dominance in the production and dissemination of culture, uh, a dominance that is greatly threatened by the internet. And again, this is not a defense of piracy. If you're uh, downloading something as a substitution for purchasing, then uh, I think you'd be hard-pressed in most cases to justify that. This is about how the law will affect how our culture is interacted with in the 21st century. And that is all for today's discussion. Um, I've tried to have this episode done before anything actually happened with SOPA, but as of today, on January 21st, the bill has been uh, postponed 
largely due to the um, public outcry that happened on the internet. Um, so the bill's been postponed, which means they're going to probably revise some provisions and resubmit it at a later date. All episodes of Barncat Media will be posted onto my Facebook as well as my YouTube channel, Barncat Media. I will see you next time.